It's a song that reached the top five all over the world, and it went to number one in eight different countries. It was also one of the early warning shots of the second British invasion, and its singer slash writer, he'd only learned how to play an instrument months before he wrote this song. And although it's gone down in history as one of the most pivotal tracks of the 80s, the singer actually hated it. I mean, he hoped that no one would ever hear it. He made sure it was the last track on the album, and he actually begged his label not to release it. But that wasn't enough. The song was pure pop gold, and they weren't going to pass on such a surefire hit. It is the story of the song, and one of the most influential bands of the 80s is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever wore a stonewashed jacket or stonewashed jeans, you're going to dig this channel. Nostalgia all the time. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you always know when the latest and greatest interviews and stories are coming out. We also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out. You can get full interviews there. You can become an honorary producer. And you also uh, check out our new merch, including our Vintage Years collection. We have brought the price down on those. So I'm excited to return to another one of my favorite shows that we do on this channel. It's called Breakthrough. I like it because we break down you know, songs, albums, or events that really kicked open the door to an artist or band's career and gave them that momentum to, uh, to succeed long term. Uh, previous episodes, we've covered Boys Don't Cry by The Cure, Westin Girls by Pet Shop Boys, and uh, Centerfold by Jay Giles' band just recently. Now, today we're showcasing the rise of UK band The Human League and their breakthrough number one smash. Don't you want me? Sorry, don't you want me, baby? Often credited as synth pop's first international superstars, the Human League was at the forefront of a long line of new wave acts to hit the pop mainstream in the early 80s. Uh, with a combination of catchy melodies and you know, state-of-the-art tech, they proved to be an incredibly influential band on countless 80s acts following in their wake. The Human League came out of the same industrial UK city uh, that ABC and Def Leppard did, Sheffield, in the late 70s. Uh, initially, computer operators Ian Craig, Marsh, and there was Martin Ware, they put together a group called The Future. Uh, their intent was to fuse pop with stark, expressionist electronic music, with more of an emphasis on the latter. But Ware and Marsh needed a singer, so they turned to a high school friend, Philip Oakey. Now, although Oki had no musical experience, he was a handsome guy, he was flamboyantly dressed for success, and he was willing to give it a try. So they brought him aboard. So after becoming a trio, Martin Ware changed the group's name to the Human League. Just a phenomenal name. Uh, he actually took the moniker from the sci-fiction board game Star Force Alpha Centauri. Uh, not long after, the group recorded a demo, and then they started to play their first live dates. By 1978, though, the band signed with the Edinburgh indie label Fast Product. Their first single, Being Boiled, that sold 16,000 copies and it paved the way for a tie-in contract with Virgin Records. Also in 1978, they added non-musician Philip Adrian Wright to the lineup. Uh, Wright actually took on the role of director of visuals which uh, had him working the lighting and slideshows during live performances. In 1979, the Human League released their first full-length record, Reproduction, and they followed that up with the UK Top 20 album Travelog, and that was in 1980. However, by this point, friction was really mounting, and Oki and Ware began fighting over the direction they wanted to take the band. Ware insisted that the band maintain a purely electronic sound, but Oki wanted to emulate more successful pop groups. Ultimately, Marsh and Ware quit the band, and at the end of 1980, they founded BEF, the British Electric Foundation, and of course, Heaven 17 after that. In return for a percentage of royalties on future releases, though, uh, Marsh and Ware gave Oki the okay to keep the name Human League. 
But this meant that Phil was responsible to honor their contract with Virgin Records. He had some debt there. Uh, he also had to play the band's approaching European tour. Just one problem, neither Oki nor Wright played any instruments. When the press caught wind of the split, they were quick to write off Philip Oki. But uh, turning deaf ears to naysayers, he and Wright got to work learning how to play the keyboard. And then they started searching for additional band members. In the process, they turned up Ian Burden. Uh, but Oki also wanted to add a female component to the band as well. Someone who could, you know, cover the high parts that Ware had previously sung in them. Just as time was running out, Phil spotted two dancing teenage girls at the Crazy Daisy Discotheque in his town. Uh, best friends Joanne Catherell and Susan Sully were only 17. They'd yet to graduate from school, even. Like Oki himself, the girls had no previous musical experience. But they could dance, and they looked really cool. So, half desperate, half inspired, Oki invited them to join this band. Susan and Joanne, they accepted the offer, but they had to run it by their parents. So before this deal could be sealed, Phil visited with the girl's parents and he you know, explained the opportunity. Ultimately, it was agreed that the chance to see Europe would be a good opportunity for these best friends. So the arrival of these dancing girls was met with skepticism by the music press who were already convinced that the Human League was essentially done. And initially, audiences were pretty hostile. Fans who had purchased tickets were expecting the original lineup. The tour would test the steel of the band's newest members if the girls had objects thrown at them on more than one occasion. After the tour ended, the band turned their attention to really recording the Human League album, the next album, Dare. So for the making of the record, Virgin paired the band with producer Martin Rushent. In the past, Rushent had worked with uh, punk bands, you know, like the Buzzcocks. But he also knew how to layer synth sounds, and uh, that would be key for this record. And then the record label Virgin, they also insisted that the band's rookie cast of characters uh, needed a, a veteran presence. So professional musician and former Rosello punk guitarist Joe Callis was added to the mix. The group's new sound kept the frozen synth textures of Human League's earlier material but it was also infused with a new melodic brightness. Uh, for listeners, uh, it clicked right away. In the UK, Dare's first three singles, they all charted well. Uh, the first single, Sound of the Crowd, that uh, fell just short of the top 10. It reached number 12. Next, uh, Love Action, I Believe in Love, that climbed to number three. And then Open Your Heart, that went to number six. Suddenly, the Human League were new wave stars across the United Kingdom. And although they were still really unknown in America, that was all about to change with the release of the album's fourth single, Don't You Want Me. Don't you want me? Oh, to Americans first encountering the Human League in 1982, uh, the band must have seemed like a high concept joke. I mean, everything uh, about them ran counter to rock and roll expectation. Here's what I mean. Taking a look at Dare's liner notes, the credits would read uh, Philip Oakey, vocals and synthesizers, uh, Joan Catherall, uh, vocals, Susan Sully, vocals, Ian Burden, synthesizers, Joe Cal synthesizers, and Philip Adrian Wright, occasional synthesizers and slides. Uh, for those of you keeping score at home, <laughs> that's three vocalists, three and a half keyboardists, and a slideshow specialist. Conspicuously absent from the mix is the traditional rock trifecta of guitar, bass, and drums. And this wasn't accidental. In interviews, the band called guitars archaic. Back in the early 80s, that was completely new territory for the listening public. But thanks to Don't You Want Me, it actually went over very well. As we continue to break down this 80s classic, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I wear every single day. Now, speaking of the 80s, with Zenny's amazing variety of colors, and shapes, and fashions, you can bring classic looks from any decade, you know, to, to bring some, some zip to your style. Check it out today at zenny.com or actually get the new Zenny app on your phone.
So Don't You Want Me, the song itself, is sparse and, and stylish. It puts the singers and their drama in the foreground, but pulses with layers of hooks underneath. Don't You Want Me is it's just a welcome slice of pop magic. Now, that being said, Phil Oakey didn't think it was pop magic at all. His initial version of the song was much more subdued and really less radio friendly. But, don't forget it's me who put you where you are now. but producer Martin Shent wasn't happy with that sound, so he and Callis remixed the track, you know, gave it a more upbeat commercial sound. It was pure ear candy, and Phil Oakey hated it. Don't you want me? Don't. In fact, he thought it was the worst song on the album by far, and he despised it so much that he made sure that it, it was the last song on the record, the last song that people would hear that bought the record. So when Virgin pushed to release Don't You Want Me as Dare's fourth single, uh, let's just say there was some real resistance. Oki was absolutely convinced that another single would sink the band's newfound popularity in the UK. Uh, the public was going to get sick of hearing uh, this band you know, releasing a poor quality filler track. That would be a disaster. But Virgin A&R execs, they loved it. And they weren't going to take no for an answer. Oki finally agreed to its release on the condition that the single come with a large color poster so fans wouldn't feel ripped off by such a substandard song. Believe that. Of course, Oki was completely wrong. By the end of December 1981, Don't You Want Me was a number one hit in the U.S. and Dare's most successful single worldwide. It put these guys on the map everywhere. You don't, don't, you want me. don't You Want Me. It tackles an unusual subject for a mainstream pop hit. You think about it. As Oki described it, the song is about power politics. And one might add self-delusion as well. Sometimes mistaken for a love song, its double point of view actually trades perspectives on a relationship that has fallen apart. Now, originally, Oki conceived the song as a male solo, but then he reframed it into a call and response format when he invited Susan Sully to pick up the female perspective. But even then, I knew I'd find a much better place. Why Susan and not Joanne? Well, according to Susan, it was just the luck of the draw. Apparently, the lyrics were inspired in part by a photo story that Phil found in a Teen Girls magazine. Uh, and also the 1976 film A Star Is Born, that was influential to the song as well. Christopher said, closely now. A Star Is Born. Don't You Want Me starts from the guy's perspective, who sings about meeting a cocktail waitress and turning her into a star. First, it sounds like it's you know, going to be a rags to riches fairy tale. That is, until it takes a, a bitter left turn into some dark and manipulative territory. Now that this girl is famous, she wants nothing to do with this guy, and Oki's character turns ugly really fast. Posturing himself as the reason for her success, he straight up threatens to pull the rug out from under her. He sings, It's me who put you where you are now, and I can put you back down too. Yet by the time he reaches the chorus, it's clear that he desperately he starts to hurl empty threats, singing, you better change it back or we will both be sorry. However, it's clear that this girl is not buying his story at all. Susan's perspective, she concedes that, you know, sure, they met when she was a waitress in a cocktail bar. That much is true. <laughs> But she quickly lets him know that, you know, he wasn't responsible for her success. He was just uh, adjacent to it. She sings, even then, I knew I'd find a much better place either with or without you. Either with or without you. The when Susan sings that their years together have been such good times, it actually sounds more like a dismissal than a happy recollection. The And her, I still love you, that feels more like a brush off than an invitation to start things up again. I still love you. I mean, all this guy can do in response is, is keep singing. 
the pleading chorus over and over again, and that's really where it ends. Don't You Want Me presents a tangled mess of feelings that keep it far from being a love song. Jealousy, spite, possessiveness, vulnerability, and really justification. It's an eye-opening look into what happens when a relationship falls apart and power dynamic is reversed. And honestly, it was a welcome breath of fresh air on the mainstream pop charts. I mean, listeners around the world love this song. It was just so different. It was out of left field. As I mentioned, Don't You Want Me, it went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. I mean, outside of Blondie, this is really, it was really the first number one new wave song, straight new wave. I mean, it went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. It fired off uh, along with Cars and, and with Tainted Love. It also climbed to number four on the U.S. Rock Tracks chart, went to number three on the Hot Dance chart. Internationally, it reached number 13 in France. Uh, it broke the top 10 pretty much everywhere else in the world. It went to number seven in Italy, to number five in the Netherlands and Germany, number four in Spain, Australia, and Switzerland, number three in Sweden, number two in South Africa, number one in Canada, Belgium, Israel, Norway, New Zealand, Ireland, and the UK, and it stayed there for five weeks in the UK. Don't You Want Me was actually the biggest selling UK single of 1981, even though it was released by the end of November. Adding to the song's momentum was this well-crafted music video, now, directed by Steve Barron. Uh, the video captures the couple's ice-cold relationship perfectly. No, I can't believe it when I hear that you will see me, don't. While drawing your attention to the layers of its own artificiality. You know I don't believe you when you say that you don't need me. This clip was perfect for MTV. You know, this is as the, the fledgling network started to, to gain clout. Don't You Want Me became one of its first true flagship videos along with other early MTV adopters, Don't You Want Me helped establish really the new rules for pop success. But Don't You Want Me's influence, it didn't stop there. Through the years, the Human League standard has appeared on a, a lot of movies and TV shows and pop culture. It's Cold Case, He's Just Not That India, CSI Luther, Glee Guapas, The Layover, Glow, just recently the revival of Quantum Leap. Don't You Want Me has also been covered by Neon Trees, Information Society, Smashing Pumpkins, Better Than Ezra, Presidents of the United States of America, Kelly Clarkson, Beck, Maroon 5 just did it, and uh, Natalie Mershon. And just for good measure, Heaven 17 covered it as well. Don't, don't you want me? Bottom line, don't you want me? One of the 80s most defining pop moments. By the end of 1981, the Human League had a number one album and single, and Don't You Want Me was approaching sales of one million copies. So how did the band fare after that? Well, after the success of Dare and Don't You Want Me, the Human League released the Fascination EP in 1983, and they scored a pair of hits with Mirror Man and Keep Feeling Fascination. In May of 84, the highly anticipated full-length album Hysteria hit the shelves. However, it failed to replicate the massive success of Dare, uh, in the U.S. at least. Although three singles did break into the top 20 in the UK where they were far more popular. Hello, Louise. And actually one of those songs, Louise, was written to continue the story of Don't You Want Me uh, years later. A lot of people don't realize this. The tell of Louise uh, superficially, at least, seems to be about a chance encounter between former lovers who were on the verge of reconciling. 
However, just, just like Don't You Want Me, uh, the song has a, a much darker subtext. Oki said about it, it's about men thinking they can manipulate women when they can't, even conning themselves that they have when they haven't. Check it out and see what you think. Now should we part or stay a while? Now the league returned again in 86 with their next album, Crash, and their second number one Hot 100 hit, Human. Human. However, despite Human's success, the group really couldn't capitalize and they banished from the charts for the rest of the decade. That always confused me. Um, Human is a great song. The Human League also released two studio albums in the 90s, Romantic in 1990 and then Octopus in 95. The pair would produce the band's last two Hot 100 singles with Heart Like a Will that reached number 32 and Tell Me When, doing one better coming in at number 31. Uh, bringing some 80s into the 90s in such a great way. I love that song. He's taking your time when you want to be free. Will I see you again? And the new millennium, the Human League, has released two more albums, or Secrets in 2001 and uh, Credo in 2011. Don't You Want Me by the Human League was an absolute game changer for me as, as a little kid. It probably was for you as well. I remember I was six years old when I first heard it. Uh... I remember I was, I was swimming in the kiddie pool at Lava Hot Springs when it came on, and I was just freaking out. And I loved this song. I was so happy when the DJ said, uh, you know, who was the artist that sang it. Remember about a month later, it was the first time that I actually figured out how to record a song off the radio onto a cassette tape. I sang it all the time. I remember I got sent to stand in the corner uh, when I burst out singing... Uh, this song to my first grade teacher who asked me where I learned such a suggestive song. Of course, I had no idea what suggestive meant. I just knew it was the coolest song that I'd ever heard up to that point. Little did I know that uh, I was at the beginning of the 80s and I would have that same experience and think that at least a uh, hundred more times before the decade was over. That's why the 80s ruled. But it all started with the human league. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about human league and don't you want me. It is such a perfect slice of 80s pop. It's one of the greatest songs of the 80s. Tell us your memories, your thoughts below. Let's have a great discussion and honor this song like it should be. If you like our content, make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out on our daily videos. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.